Thank you very much. Good afternoon, or good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? If you're from the East Coast, it's, it's afternoon, right? Awesome. Um, thank you very much, Jeffrey, and uh, thank you all for coming. I'm going to be talking about um, uh, some of the more radical ideas from my new book, The Practice of Cloud System Administration. I should say uh, well, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've worked at uh, Google for about seven years. Uh, I'm now at Stack Exchange, um, wrangling a lot of the stuff that George just talked about. Um, I also blog and tweet and all sorts of stuff. This is uh, not my first book. Um, the book uh, is actually a project of uh, three people. Uh, my co-authors couldn't come to Lisa this year, but uh, they are familiar faces here at the conference. Uh, Strata has more than 25 years' experience in sysadmin, uh, works in Silicon Valley. Uh, Christine is, um, some of you who know her know that she left system administration a while back to design Formula One race cars, but she's back in system administration. Uh, that's a story I can tell maybe over beers tonight. The book uh, was a two-year project and a uh, little bit of timeline, um, but that's probably not as interesting to you as it is to us. The book actually has two parts. The subtitle is Building and uh, Designing Large Distributed Systems. The first part is about the design of large systems. And, um, we don't say this in the marketing material, but it's basically distributed computing explained in a way that system administrators would understand, right? Because you're, when you're running these large systems, you need to be able to communicate with the developers. And you don't need a PhD in distributed computing, but at least you need to be able to communicate. Um, and you need to be able to communicate with the developers about what design elements need to be there. So it's a lot about the, the design patterns you should expect to find uh, in systems. Then the second part, which is much larger, is about running large systems. And it covers everything from service de delivery, like uh, CI, you know, continuous build and integration, uh, to monitoring and managing on call and stuff. And then, um, well, okay. But I'm not here to just talk about the book, or talk, I'm, I'm not here to, to plug the book. What I'm really here to talk about is some of the more interesting, to me, ideas from the book. Now, the book title is a little confusing because it says the cloud. And um, you know, we talk about the cloud a lot, right? You know, marketing loves to talk about the cloud. The cloud, who doesn't love the cloud? The cloud is awesome, right? Everyone loves the cloud. Um, the cloud, the cloud, and um, more cloud. You know, we love the cloud. Who, who hearts the cloud? Everyone, raise your hand. We, we heart the cloud, right? And why do we heart the cloud? We heart it because the cloud solves all problems, right? There, there are no problems left in the world anymore now that the cloud's here, right? It's, praise the cloud, it's so great. And, um, <laughs> and it's really a bunch of BS, right? <laughs> it's, it's become this marketing term. Um, so actually the first thing we say about the cloud in the book is that we're not gonna use the term cloud for the rest of the book. <laughs> um, Cloud means many different things to many different people. In the business world, it means like the elastic ability to get new computing resources and stuff. But to a system administrator, it really means distributed computing. And distributed computing is, well, let's go back in time. Remember old computers, like, you know, the room size computers? No, neither do I. But um, so, you know, computers used to be big, and to do work, you had to go to them, right? Because they, they weren't networked. Um, and even when they got smaller, you had to go to them to do work. And th then networks came, and we had client-server computing. And that was awesome, because you didn't have to be standing next to the computer to do something. And client-server computing was so awesome that these servers here at the bottom started getting bigger and bigger and bigger because they were handling more and more users. And eventually, they got so big that um, they hit the limits. They hit too many limits. And um, vendors discovered that they could charge a lot more to the couple companies that needed the really big machines. And so it wasn't as economically feasible to grow anymore. Luckily, in the late 90s, 
computer scientists started talking about, well, what about distributed computing? What if, what if we take lots of little machines and distri distribute the work that we're going to do over these many different machines? So as a result, we had things like genomic systems where hundreds of machines take a data set, each takes their part of a data set, does their work, and the combined output is much more powerful than any one computer could do. Or web services, like George mentioned, um, uh, we both work at Stack Exchange. We have about 10 machines that each take one-tenth of the tr web traffic that comes to us, and each one uh, does, it, does its part. You can also distribute storage over many machines. So, for example, Gmail has many thousands of machines that combine to, to store all of Gmail's email. The point is that distributed computing can do more work than the single largest computer. And I can prove that very easily. If, you, if I have a nice distributed computer network and you come to me as a vendor and say, well, ha, I've beaten you, I have one machine that's bigger than everything that you do, I'd say, awesome, uh, give me 10 of them, I'll build a distributed network out of it, and now I'm bigger, right? So by definition, distributed computing will always be bigger than what a single computer can do. But what was discovered in the late 90s, early aughts, was that distributed computing had a whole new set of challenges. So when you have thousands of users or millions of users, the risks become bigger. If you have a, an email server, I remember my first email server, we had like 50 users. If it was down, didn't matter because there was a good chance all 50 weren't reading email at that moment. But when you have millions of users, risks become much more visible, or outages become much more visible. Automation becomes mandatory. It's no longer this would be nice, it's uh, a key component of what lets us stay in business. And cost containment becomes critical. If you buy a one server and you accidentally buy the slightly nicer video card that you're never gonna use because it doesn't even have a monitor, who cares, it's 50 bucks, no problem. But if you waste 50 bucks times 10,000 machines, now you're talking real money. In fact, if you spend an extra $2 on a fancy nameplate on the front of each box, at 10,000 machines, you're talking real money. So in response to these problems, a lot of innovative solutions came up and uh, new things that uh, started in distributed computing and trickling down to uh, all other areas of computing uh, were, have been discovered. So, for example, some really radical ideas about how to reduce risk to the point that uh, there's new models. They talk about computing, improving uh, the safety of operations. Reliability becomes a much more competitive benefit. Uh, it turns out nobody goes to a website that's down. Um, entirely new automation uh, paradigms were created and also new ways of thinking about cost and, and the economics of computing. But what I'd like to talk about today, what I find most interesting, is the realization that when you're dealing with large-scale systems, we need to make peace with failure. You see, little components fail, and in a small environment, you might, well, you know, that gets me upset, but I'll muddle through it. Well, in a large distributed system, there's always going to be some kind of failure. If you have 100,000 hard disks, and hard disks have 100,000 mean time between failures, that means every hour, on average, you have a hard disk failing. If a hard disk failure is a panic emergency, then you're gonna spend all of your time in panic. So instead, we need to deal with the fact that parts are imperfect and networks are imperfect. We need to build systems, like in the morning keynote, he was talking about dealing with resiliency, not just redundancy. But also code is imperfect. We need to build systems that are resilient against bugs. And people are imperfect. Uh, we need to build systems that are resilient against uh, human error. In other words, we need to learn how to fail better. And that's the, the really exciting thing about distributed computing to me. Um, when preparing this talk, I thought, well, let me research what were some of the big success stories in reliability you know, before distributed computing. And I found a lot of articles about the 5ESS phone switch. 
How many people here ever administered a 5 ESS phone switch? Awesome. This was the phone switch that practically ran the uh, probably 80% of the world's telecommunication system. And it is known as being best in class reliability. There were, um, there was a three year period where a num um, there was less than 10 seconds downtime per machine in, um, continuously you know, running for three years. In fact, there were many machines that had 100% uptime for uh, years on end. And how did they achieve that? They achieved that by defining planned maintenance doesn't count as an outage. <laughs> right? So you can buy the best components, the most reliable computer, and it's still going to fail. But if you, even, uh, even if it doesn't fail, you need to plan for, you know, there's certain maintenance procedures that require um, the system being turned down. So let's talk about three ways that we can fail better. Um, better than what was done on the 5 ESS phone switch. And my recommendation and the, the take homes that uh, I'm giving to you today is these three bits of advice. I recommend that you use cheaper, less reliable hardware. If a process or procedure is risky, do it a lot. And don't punish people for outages. Make sense? If everyone agrees, we can go home. Okay, cool. So um, now for those of you that are confused and thinking, wait, 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 are, are these the things that people do that Tom says we should correct? No, these are the recommendations. So let's drill down into each of them. So first, we're going to use cheaper, less reliable hardware. Um, as an analogy, let me talk about rental cars. I uh, travel a lot, I rent a lot of cars, and when you rent a car, they offer you many different kinds of insurance, right? And, uh, and it would be fiscally irresponsible for me to get all of the different insurances, uh, especially since my personal auto insurance covers any rental cars that I get, and my homeowner's insurance also covers any rental cars that I get. And if I rent the car on Amex, that covers the rental car that I get. So it would be physically, I'm fiscally irresponsible for me to get all the insurances, especially since I'm already covered. And yet, people do that. Um, and this is my metaphor for how we, how we used to design systems. So think about how uh, possibly not you, but a friend has designed a, a web server. So they say, well, building a web server for the company, so we want it to be really reliable. So we're going to buy the most high-end server we can find, because, you know, the high-end servers are more reliable. And we're going to use RAID, because, yeah, we want the storage to be reliable too. And dual power supplies, yeah, we're going to, you know, dual power supplies is a great option. We're going to put it on a UPS, and we're going to get the gold maintenance package, right? Four-hour response time. Oh, and let's make it even more reliable. Let's get five of them and put it behind a load balancer. And let's also, that's going to require us to rewrite the code of our web application to handle being distributed over many machines. And that's a cost. We have to count that as a cost, re rewriting that code. Ah, uh, and there's one more thing we're going to do. We're going to get a second load balancer, right? Because we really want, you know, one, one should, could be in maintenance, you know, while the other's in use. So again, we're designing resiliency by spending money at many different levels uh, instead of thinking strategically. In other words, so one of the things that was... Uh, a tenant of distributed computing is, as often as possible, try to do your reliability through software, your, your resiliency through software. It costs once to develop it, and then you can deploy it to all the machines you buy, as opposed to doing hardware resiliency if uh, every time you buy a machine, you're going to need to buy that hardware. So it's a bad economics. It doesn't scale. So rather than... Um, getting the best hardware and writing code to make things distributed and double spend, we're just going to write that code. It's not always possible, but we want to do that everywhere we can. And as a result, our web server, uh, 
the servers that we buy, the individual machines, instead of focusing on reliability, we can focus on efficiency. If you saw in the keynote this morning, everything, uh, once they dealt with the resiliency issue, everything was about efficiency. And efficiency, it turns out, is more important. Re re resiliency is, um, it's easy to get, right? You just keep spending more and more money. If you focus on efficiency, you're taking the total cost of ownership into account. And these techniques work whether you have a grid of machines or you know, your everyday server system. And big resiliency is cheaper in many different ways. For, actually, it's cheaper as you get bigger. So if you have a load balancer and two web servers, you have to run each of them at 50%, because if one of them fails, you need enough spare capacity on the other one to handle the failover, right? With two machines, that's 50% spare capacity that you're reserving. With 10 machines, it's 10%. So would you rather tell your CEO, hi, we're buying lots of machines and about half of them are kind of being held as an insurance policy? Or would you say, oh, we, held, we hold 10% of each, all the capacity we purchase as, uh, as our insurance policy. It's much more cost effective as you get bigger. And that's why cloud services are often able to provide those services, I'm sorry, cloud providers are able to provide the service often much cheaper than you can do it yourself. So this efficiency comes from starting with an SLA and buying enough resiliency to meet it as opposed to just always trying to exceed it. And load balancing and redundancy is just one way to achieve this reliability. In fact, uh, there's a great story from Google. Uh, early in their uh, history, they needed, they had an application that required large amounts of uh, read-only uh, information, mostly read-only information. So they would store it in RAM so they had very fast access to it. Now, when you, um, when you're dealing with RAM, you know, you get like the parity RAM or double parity RAM, uh, like one in like 100 trillion error, errors will get through double parity RAM, so like, sounds like a good thing. But when you're dealing with terabytes and terabytes of RAM, uh, errors get through. I mean, you know, a one in trillion error happens a lot when you have so much memory. So they built a software resiliency system for this, this data. They were doing internal checksumming of the data structures. And so they could spot errors better than the double parity RAM. So they were able to save money by buying single parity RAM. And then they saved even more money when one day one of their purchasing people called the, the RAM chip vendors that they were dealing with and said, hey, you know those RAM chips that you make and, well, they power up, but they fail your quality tests, so they're, they kind of work, but not good enough to sell. What do you do with those? And he said, well, we, we throw them out. It costs us money to uh, have them carted away. And he said, well, would you sell them to us? <laughs> and he said, yeah, we'll sell them at like pennies on the dollar. So Google was able to buy up huge amounts of RAM incredibly cheaply because they were doing the resiliency for that in software. And at the time, there was this, um, you know, a lot of competitive pressure uh, from other search engines, and they were able to do this particular application cheaper than any of their competitors because they were doing this resiliency through software. So that's part one. Use cheaper, less reliable hardware because you're doing that resiliency in software. Part two, I recommended if a process or procedure is risky, do it a lot. This also sounds backwards, but think about it. There are two different things. Risky behavior is different than a risky procedure. Risky behavior is inherently risky. There are certain behaviors that the risk is inherent. These things can't be done any more uh, safely, right? Shooting yourself in the foot is inherently risky. I can't recommend a way to do it better. Letting children play with matches, inherently risky. But that's behavior. Procedures, on the other hand, can be improved through practice. So here are some risky or potentially risky procedures. You know, doing a big software upgrade, that's risky. But if you practice enough, it will, the, the risk will be reduced. So at Stack Exchange, 
We have uh, two primary data centers in New York and Oregon. And um, Oregon's our disaster recovery uh, data center. So we mostly run out of New York and we can fail over to Oregon. When I joined, um, I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. Show me the, the failover procedure. And I was told, well, uh, you know, it's not that simple. And I said, but we use, you know, SQL Server, you know, always on availability, right? It's, it's a my Microsoft product. did not you just, like, press a button, like, click with the mouse and it just fails over? And, and they said, oh, yeah, that, that part's pretty easy. It's just that we also have all this, you know, Redis and Elasticsearch and these other things, and you have to coordinate them all and, and do it just right. I was like, uh, okay, I, I get that, so, so let's practice it. And so the, we hadn't done it in, the company hadn't done a failover in a while, so the first time we did it as a drill, we didn't need to failover, but we just came in on a Saturday and said, let's, let's do a failover to make sure we have the process right. So we did the failover and it took more than 10 hours. It required hands-on involvement by people from three different teams. During these 10 hours, we filed more than 30 bugs for uh, code improvements, procedure improvements, documentation improvements. And we also learned something very important. We learned that there was a certain person that was a single point of fail, failure. In other words, we could not do this failover unless Nick was around. That's kind of dangerous, right? So luckily we did this on a Saturday when we didn't need to so we could learn these things. And then we started doing that over and over again. So uh, the first time, as I said, about 30 bugs were failed. It took more than 10 hours. We did it again a couple months later. 20 bugs were failed during our five-hour failover. So we cut the time in half. Good, good for us. Pat ourselves on the back. Then the next drill, uh, a couple months later, we got it down to two hours, and we recently did it in one hour flat. I hope next year at Lisa, I can say that we've gotten down to five minutes or a single button push or maybe even just fully automatic. So why did doing these drills improve things? It's because when you f stress a system like this, it doesn't get weaker, it gets stronger because it surfaces the areas of improvement and gives you an opportunity to make changes that improve the process, improves the code. It's also better because of the small batches principle. Small batches principle is um, something you hear a lot in DevApp circles. Uh, the way I like to explain small batches is by talking about the um, like software upgrades in general. So remember when Microsoft Office was like every three years there was a new version and that upgrade was, it was a big pain in the butt, right? It was um, months of planning, there were incompatibility issues, it was a very expensive process and it was high risk. Contrast that to in distributed computing where you often have uh, many software releases a week, or if, uh, if you've seen the recent blog post by Etsy, they did 9,000 software upgrades to their website last year. That's uh, 35 a day, which if their engineers only worked, you know, eight or so hours a day, that's, um, that means they were doing pushes like every 15 minutes, there's a new software release on the Etsy.com website. That's incredible. And you can do that uh, at such a high frequency when you've fully automated things and it makes it easier to fix failures, right? Because the, um, every, every change is very small. It's a small batch and therefore uh, if there's a problem, you, you know what caused it, right? You, the one change that was in that little batch. So Big Bang releases are inherently risky but small batches are better. So like I said before, uh, there's smaller changes in each batch, therefore if there's a bug, you know where it is, right? If there's a thousand changes in a big batch, then if there's a bug, you have to figure out which of those thousand changes it is. It also reduces lead time. So it's easier to debug code that you've just recently dealt with. If you do a software upgrade once a year and find a bug, that bug takes twice as long to fix because the developer has to find the code, ref refresh their memory about what it does, and deal with it. If it was code that they wrote this morning and there's a bug, it's a lot easier to debug. Um, also, the environment has changed less. 
how many people have done, you know, one upgrade, it went great, another upgrade a month or two later, and there was some change to the environment that made the upgrade fail, right? Some unexpected change like, oh, we have a different SAN vendor now, or some network change happened, or the DNS server IP address changed. If you're doing a lot of releases, then um, there are fewer of these external changes per release, so it's easier to find and fix them. What really interests me about the small batches principles is the new research by psychologists that find that small batches lead to happier, more motivated employees. I think that's pretty cool. It's like a job benefit to work at a company that does small batches. Uh, and this is because you get more instant gratification. Imagine the programmer who added the original spell checker to Microsoft Word. He wrote all that code and then had to wait for a three-year release cycle for, to be able to you know, show his friends like, oh, isn't this the cool stuff I did? Contrast that to Etsy where you know, 15, 20 minutes later, you're able to call someone and say, or I am someone and say, hey, check out this new feature that just went live. That's pretty cool. Also, it makes for a less stressful work environment because you've reduced this risk and risk leads to stress. Risk is inversely proportional to how recently a process has been used. If you have recently done a disk restore and it was successful, you have a lot of confidence in your backup system. If you've never done a test restore of your backups, that's incredibly risky. You don't know how good they are. And so small batches enables us to reverse, uh, to reduce risk in that way. A company that's really good at this is Netflix. They have a system called Chaos Monkey that goes around and randomly reboots machines to always, so that they're always testing their resiliency mechanisms. And this Chaos Monkey runs nine to five when all their developers are around so that if there's a bug in the resiliency system, they learn about it when everybody is in the office, awake and sober, which is so much more effective than discovering a bug in your resiliency system at four in the morning on a weekend when the core developers are on vacation. So, I hope I now have convinced you of point number two. If a process or procedure is risky, do it a lot. Which leads us to my third point. Don't punish people for outages. Like I said before, there will always be outages. I mean, we had this whole discussion about how every part of a system can fail from components to people. Therefore, getting angry about outages is equivalent to expecting them to never happen, which is irrational. And yet, many businesses and organizations have a culture that assumes that outages will never happen and therefore People get punished when that happens. So let's talk about some outdated attitudes about outages. Attitude number one, management expects 100% uptime. Number two, if we don't have 100% uptime, someone's gonna get punished, right? So what happens in an environment like that? Well, you would do what anyone would do. You would start to hide problems, right? You don't wanna get punished, so you hide problems. Um, people stop communicating. Less communication means less visibility, less chance I'll be punished. You dis this discourages transparency. And small problems get ignored and therefore they turn into big problems. In other words, management that has tried to get 100% perfect uptime has created an environment that is going to have all the cultural problems that reduce uptime which is kind of ironic. So the new thinking on outages is to not expect 100% uptime. We, we embrace failure. We understand that failure is gonna happen. So we set uptime goals. We have SLAs that are reasonable, like three nines with a 0 0.5 deviation. That's a very reasonable target. And instead of assuming that outages won't happen, we anticipate them. We strategically design our systems to be resilient. We develop an on-call system. We develop uh, drills, like the drills I mentioned before, to keep in practice for the, the, the failover scenarios. 
and those drills improve the process. So as a result, we encourage transparency, we get more communication, small problems get fixed when they're small, they don't turn into big problems, and the overall uptime is improved. So by actually having a more modern thinking about outages, we create an environment that leads to more resilient systems. Some other things that we do in this new thinking is we stop talking about root causes. There is no root cause. There are only contributing factors. I can kind of prove this in reverse. If something's a success, was there one thing that made it a success? No, lots of things have to come together to make something a success. And similarly, for a failure to happen, a lot of different things had to come together to let it happen. So the outage didn't, wasn't caused because Tom typed the wrong command. I mean, that's a contributing factor. Tom typed the wrong command, and the command didn't do error checking that caught the issue, and the system wasn't resilient to that kind of bug, and the documentation was unclear, which led Tom to typing the wrong command, and there's a bug filed six months ago saying that that documentation needs to be improved, and that bug hasn't gotten around to it yet, so we have a resource allocation thing. These are all different contributing factors to why there was an outage. Part of this is, um, well, another uh, cultural artifact is to write postmortems for any outage. A postmortem is, actually, postmortem is the process where you an analyze the outage. A postmortem document is that document that you produce um, that uh, communicates what, what went wrong, how it went wrong, et cetera. And a lot of people fear postmortems because it's all about blaming. It's, uh, you know, find the blame, find the root cause, which is a person which is going to be fired and punished. Um, so what I recommend is blameless postmortems. Uh, John Ospaw has a number of great uh, blog posts about this concept. Um, when we remove the blame from a postmortem, instead we have responsibility. So the people that were involved in the outage, instead of feeling blamed, uh, they take responsibility. So responsibility for making the long-term fix or uh, being the advocate for that fix if it's something that's out of their control. Uh, responsibility for educating other teams how to learn from this. In theory, uh, Google's postmortem process was blameless, and often uh, the people involved in writing it, like if there was any uh, punishment, the punishment was you uh, wrote up a, a presentation on what did you learn, how can you fix this in the future, and you gave that presentation around to all the other SRE teams so that they could learn from it also which means the organization got smarter every time there was an outage and people took responsibility for doing the right thing. On August 25th, there was a seven-minute outage at our site, Stack Exchange. And this is the postmortem that we wrote up afterwards. The postmortem format that I recommend is very simple. First, have a template. It's easier to write something if, if there's a template. And the template is, that we use just has like these six or seven headers. Um, the headings is, uh, the first is summary. So basically, you know, exactly what happened, what the cause is, and what measures we're gonna take to prevent this in the future. Oh, I said cause, I meant contributing factors, sorry. Um, and then we put this in a table because that's awesome. Um, the next heading is background information, which is essentially everything the reader needs to know to understand this document. So we, we define terminology, maybe we give the history or explain the architecture, whatever is needed. The next section is the timeline. So this is a minute by minute accounting of what happened. So at 1901, bad code was pushed into Git. Uh, 20 minutes later, Puppet ran and pushed that code around our systems. Soon, uh, I was paged. A couple minutes later, uh, our boss uh, got into our chat room and said, hey, why is everything broken? Um, around the same time, we were pushing the, uh, the fix, and, pu and uh, Puppet was distributing that fix, and at uh, 1932, the outage was resolved. The last four headings of the postmortem document are, in my opinion, the most important. 
uh, and it's two and two. The first two are what went right, what went wrong, and the other are uh, what do we need immediately to fix and what are the long-term fixes. So what went right, uh, the team, the different teams involved came together and communicated really well. Uh, the fact that we used Git meant we were able to revert the change with one command. What needs improving, well, you can read it there. And then the uh, things we need to do Im immediately and long-term are, are also listed. And as you can see, some of those things were already completed. Like here's the git change code um, related to some of the changes that needed to be done. So as a result, instead of, well, here, let me show you the result. So a couple minutes after emailing out this postmortem to the whole company, I got this email from a coworker. I don't know about anyone else, but I really like getting these postmortem reports. Not only is it nice to know what happened, but it's great to see how you guys handled it in the moment and how you plan to prevent these events going forward. Really neato, thanks for the great work. After an outage, getting email like this really indicates that we've developed a, a good culture. <laughs> and I'm really just proud of my coworkers that you know, everyone's able to come together like this. So, point three, don't punish people for outages. So my take homes, cloud computing, marketing, let's talk about distributed computing because from a system administrator perspective, that's really what we're talking about. And the distributed computing principles are not just at Google, Facebook, Amazon. This is a, um, trickling down into enterprise software and, and all sorts of different things. Use cheaper, less reliable hardware. By creating resiliency through software, we can save money on hardware, and hardware, and that has a, a better economic model. If a procedure is risky, do it a lot. The scientific term for improvement through repeated, uh, through repetition is practice makes perfect, and small batches improves quality and reduces stress. And lastly, don't punish people for outages even if I typed the wrong command. Lastly, I'd like to say, we as system administrators, we run services, not servers, right? A server, that's a thing, that's a box. That's a, a file server is a file server even if it's still in the box powered off. It's not useful until it's a service. We are here for services, and services are important because people depend on them. Services, run themselves when they're healthy. We are hired to be awesome in the face of failure. And so I wanna encourage everyone to think about failure and how they can improve and how they can be awesome. So thank you very much. <laughs> we have a couple minutes for q and I just wanna plug, I'm doing a book signing uh, tomorrow at 10.30. Uh, the first couple people in line will get a free copy of the book. Friday, I'm sorry, Friday. What did I say? Yes, Friday. And this is what the book looks like. So uh, questions, please come up to the mic. Or comments. Token question, just to make me feel better. <laughs> Just more of a comment. Uh, I love the, the postmortem form. Uh, ours has one additional field, which is customer visible. Uh, since we have enough backend infrastructure that customers can't see a bunch of outages, but we still consider them important enough to log and, and deal with. But uh, it makes everybody feel better if they also register, hey, something happened, but the customer didn't see it. <laughs> so. Oh, great, good point, yeah. So, um, so is that separating out what parts were customer visible and what parts were not, or is that just saying whether just, or not things were visible? Just yes or no, something on, that affiliated with this incident was customer visible or not. Ah, okay. Since we can, have, we can have failures that are a failure, but completely not visible to anybody external from the company. Sure, sure, cool, thanks. A short question and a slightly longer one. Can you post that template on your blog so that I can show it to my boss? Yes. 
Thank I'll you. have that up tonight. <laughs> you mentioned it, it's also by like appendix. I think E is all these templates that you can just steal. So if you have the PDF, you can cut and paste them. Excellent. Um, you mentioned selecting instead of 100% availability, some reasonable number less than that. Like for example, three nines. Right. How do you find a reasonable number? Ah, good question. How do you find a reasonable number? You need to have a dialogue with the um, with your customers. Uh, who like a SAC exchange that means are you know product marketing people um, or product management people uh, at other companies it might mean actual customers but to to define you know what's a reasonable SLA um, and it's an education process because they're gonna start saying well I'd like a hundred percent and then you could explain well you know the cost difference between three nines and four nines um, like ev every nine that you add uh, is like 10 times more expensive than the previous nine, uh, and maybe 100 times more expensive, um, and that 100% isn't possible. So, um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's part education and then working through on that. Yes? Hi, do you have any examples of what uh, resilience through software looks like? Do, do we have examples of what? Resilience through software looks like. Do we have Since examples of what resiliency through software yeah. looks like? Well, let me turn to the table of contents. Um, so there's actually uh, an entire chapter. So chapter six is just design patterns for resiliency. So as you're, you know, hopefully, you're in this great situation where uh, you're working with your developers from the beginning of the, de the design, not just at the end when you're about to launch. And so this gives you a vocabulary to use to when you're talking with them to say, these are the kind of resiliency options that we'd like to see. Um, there's also an entire chapter about uh, design patterns that lead to good scaling. Um, and actually, one of my favorite chapters is just design for operations, which is like, what features can you ask for that will make it easier for you to do your job, to, to be in operations? And it's things like um, f uh, hiding features behind flag flips and I don't know, it's like 20 pages of stuff. <laughs> yes? Hey, um, a comment towards um, having a non-blame culture, something that um, maybe doesn't work in every environment, but something that works in the environment that I'm in now is that um, we actually have a downtime budget that we understand. So whenever you have an outage, you know what it costs the business. The, the, the thing that it will separate someone from looking at, especially if business makes a lot of money, what seven minute outage could be worth maybe even more than your salary. So which is a really, uh, which goes in in a lot of sysadmin's heads. And something that, uh, like I said, doesn't work in every environment, but um, it's a very liberating thing to have that as a, uh, to remove the individual who was involved with an outage from the actual event. I can't agree more. Um, having a downtime budget is a great technique and Actually, I first heard that term from Ben Trainer, who's VP of S3 at Google, and we interviewed him for a, um, like half a chapter. Uh, what is it? Chapter 19 is basically the result of that interview. He was hugely cooperative. And the point he made is, if you have a downtime budget, and his recommendation was, you know, permit a certain amount of downtime in each quarter. And so as long as there's budget, developers can be as, you know, crazy and push new result, uh, new releases as they want. Once the budget is, is consumed, then the rest of the quarter can only be like priority zero uh, security fixes. And what this does is this drives the uh, developers to care about uptime, uh, and it also drives operations uh, to care about the developer productivity. So, because normally developers really, you know, they mostly care about getting new features. Um, and it's important to find a, a, a feedback system that makes them care about operations also. So yeah, I totally agree. So we're out of time. I want to thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>